Thanks so much for watching CBS 8 Plus and welcome to our weekly throwback show. I'm Jenny Day. Each week we'll dive back into the CBS 8 archives to find some of San Diego's most memorable moments. This week we begin with America's first African American military aviators. The Tuskegee Airmen took down more than 400 German aircraft during World War II. Maria Velasquez met with the San Diego chapter back in 1996 and in the following year Ted Garcia reported reported on a cable movie that introduced them to a new generation of fans. Both feature San Diegan Nelson Robinson. He was the last surviving local airman when he passed away in December of 2022. The Germans called them black birdmen, black fighter pilots who destroyed more than 400 German aircraft during World War II. But their country, America, called them the Tuskegee experiment because it was felt that we lacked the aptitude, the skills, uh, to become effective fighter pilots. But they proved to be an elite group of fighter pilots, the 99th Squadron, led by Lieutenant General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. They were trained at Alabama's segregated Tuskegee Army Air Base in the 1940s. George Mitchell was a radio communications instructor. And these are some of my students that you see in the operating positions learning code. Among his students, Lewis Murray, who became a fighter and bomber pilot. Yet after the service, there were few jobs for African-American pilots. I've been a flight instructor, a charter pilot, and of course, crop dusting, and it paid off. At 17, Nelson Robinson joined the service. The Kansas native became an aircraft mechanic. I didn't realize that I was going to be assigned to the all-black outfit because I hadn't put it together that we're in a segregated situation. Where else are you going to go with these skills? And like the other soldiers, he also lived through the discrimination of the times. Segregation isn't just the not being able to sit on the front row of the bus. Uh, segregation is don't give them credit for doing anything constructive. Show the bad stuff, never the good stuff. And that's the mission these Tuskegee Airmen are on now, a local chapter to tell their story hoping to show kids you can lead despite barriers. Maria Velasquez, News 8 Cares. It's safe to say they're a group of men who made history. The Tuskegee Airmen flew countless missions during World War II over North Africa and Europe, where they were literally baptized by fire. Targets coming up just ahead. Fire! Five decades later, a cable movie introduces them to a new generation of fans, children and teens who had little knowledge of these men who helped to break down the color barrier. Reminisce, oh, it brings back, it's nostalgia. It's, uh, it, uh, it, it, it is a great, it's a great album. Nelson Robinson is one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. He served as crew chief of the 99th Squadron during World War II. He remembers training at the segregated all-black base near Tuskegee, Alabama, before heading off for duty. He says the outfit knew they were doing something special. When you're doing something for the first time, you know that you're first. And you recognize, at least I did, the significance of, 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 of it all. Robinson was part of this year's fourth General, annual Tuskegee General, Airmen Day at Montgomery Field. In between swapping stories and sharing pictures, the men talked about the challenges they faced simply because they were black. They didn't believe that uh, we could fly an airplane. They didn't feel, they feel as if you were knowledgeable enough to uh, handle the instruments on the airplane to, to fly a plane. And that was one of the big uh, 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 complaints that were made. The soldiers proved many people wrong, and they became heroes for not only fighting America's enemies, but for fighting the enemy at home as well, racism, a real-life lesson that's still being taught today. That's why some moms and dads brought their young ones. And we wanted to teach our children about some history that they'll never learn about in school. Lessons kept alive by men who have experienced historic events they'll never forget. Ted Garcia, KFMB News 8. Yeah, it's so great to look back and, and really keep that history alive. So next we are highlighting Leon Williams, who was the first black San Diego City Council member. He served three terms before serving three terms on the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. In 1982, Williams spoke with Jesse Macias about his plan to be tough on criminals. And then in 1994, he spoke with Graham Ledger about his approach to leadership and involving members of our community. 
City Councilman Leon Williams was all smiles as he met with friends and supporters just prior to announcing his candidacy for the fourth supervisorial district seat. The 13-year veteran of the City Council says if elected June 8th to the Board of Supervisors, he will seek to consolidate certain county and city services, thus saving taxpayers money. On the issue of crime, Williams says he's going to be tough on criminals. Rapists, murderers, robbers, muggers have to be in jail. And I believe, though, that part of the problem we have is that we crowd the jails with petty offenders. I think petty offenders should, uh, should be put in honor camps or work camps or find some other method of dealing with them besides putting them in jail. Williams adds he supports county job training programs. I think that the program the county now has of causing people who are receiving welfare to receive job training is a good one and I support that. I believe everybody ought to be able to support themselves. They ought to have a job, and I believe people would if they had a job. So significant, I believe, is job training. Williams has the support of current 4th District Supervisor Jim Bates, who will be seeking the 44th Congressional Post. Meanwhile, Williams' term on the City Council expires in November of 1983, so his running for another office will initiate another appointment to the Council. Jesse Macias, News 8. After 25 years in the public eye, Leon Williams is still quite modest. Now, you know, I sort of live it to some extent by that adage that uh, you can do a lot if you don't care about getting the credit for it. Three terms on the city council, three terms on the board. Supervisor Williams has done a lot. And creating more consciousness, consciousness on the part of people, especially um, ethnic minority people who thought themselves outside the system. Leon Williams has brought his constituents inside the civic circle. When I came in the city council, they just didn't even approach city hall or even think there was a chance at government to have anybody pay attention to them. And I think we changed a lot of that. We changed almost all of that, both at the city and here. He governs not by handouts, but by handshakes, meeting with folks. Well, I've done it not so much one-on-one, -on -one, but in, in small groups, like in uh, coffees in people's houses. Through those meetings, a dialogue, a sense of civic give and take. We've gotten to people and said, it's your responsibility, you have a right, you have a responsibility to let people know what you believe and what you think is right and is wrong. And what is right to Supervisor Williams is proactive, not reactive. The way we're going to, uh, to reduce the social uh, disorganization, the crime, and all the other things that are happening that we, that we don't like is to involve people and to give them a place and give them something to live for. One year from now, Williams will be living for himself after two and a half decades of living for others. Graham Ledger, News 8. Yeah, and meantime, longtime San Diego City Councilman George Stevens didn't like the term Southeast San Diego and played a major role in changing how we highlight those communities today. When he ran for City Council in 1992, he pledged to erase the reference to the district that he represented. He fought for change in neighborhoods like Skyline, Emerald Hills, and Webster. On June 20th, 1992, the Southeast San Diego reference was actually laid to rest with a full-on funeral service. Oh, it's the connotation. It's nothing but negative gangs, high crime rate, blacks, negative. Need to get rid of it. These pictures show another side of the collection of neighborhoods we in the media commonly refer to as Southeast San Diego. The reference rankles people who live and work here and the city councilman who represents them. We have neighborhoods Skyline, Emerald Hills, Webster. Oak Park. While running for office and after being elected, George Stevens pledged to do away with the Southeast reference. Saturday, he'll host a mock funeral for the name. To bring businesses into the neighborhood, to bring dollars back into the neighborhoods, and to build single family homes and no more apartments in the neighborhoods. To some, name changing is not seen as significant. It's just really how the people get along with each other and how things are functioning in the community is really important. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter about the name to me. Obviously, it will take more than a name change to change the way this section of the city is perceived. But a perception is only a view, and views can be changed. Positive strides have been made in spite of the Southeast reference. The Southeast Economic Development Corporation, which doesn't intend to change its name, 
is bringing outside investment in. I think a number of bank presidents, um, executive directors of financial institutions have already said that they feel very comfortable in dealing with SEDC and investing in this community. But there is no doubt that the name has caused some setbacks, too. I had a teacher that was going to work with me at a summer school, but she talked to a police officer, and he said Southeast is a high-crime ghetto area. And so she was afraid to come in this area to work. Names are easy to change. Perceptions are not. George Stevens is hoping for a new beginning. Doug McAllister, News 8, Emerald Hill. On this 20th day of June, we have gathered to lay to rest Southeast. Southeast conceived in bigotry, formed by hypocrisy, born and nourished in poverty, merely a geographical area. This is not our home. You have 29,000 African Americans who live here. You have 24,000 Hispanics who live here. You have 20,000 Anglos who live here. You have 18,000 Asian Americans who live here. This is not our home. Southeast is dead. She committed suicide because she thought that her dying could make way for a new life. And she asked me to tell you that her death is not in vain because she's leaving her children and her children's names are in Canto. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Park, yeah. Mount Hope, Troy right. yeah. View, Broadway House, yeah. Emerald Hill. Yeah. What we're saying is today is we're going to change ourselves, we're going to change our neighborhood, and we're going to make those things go away because of us coming together, because of the things we're going to do together to make it happen. We can have a community that's identified by quality, by integrity, by brotherly love. If we dare embrace the quality of what Dr. King represented in the past, then let's start becoming good stewards over the present and the future. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And Judge Earl B. Gilliam was another San Diego trailblazer, becoming the first African-American to be appointed a judge in San Diego County. He was one of 11 federal judges serving the U.S. Southern District Court. Maria Velasquez profiled Gilliam in February of 1994 when Gilliam was 62 years old and recuperating from heart surgery. She talked with members of the Earl B. Gilliam Bar Association. After dark, most downtown San Diego offices empty out. But once a month, the Earl B. Gillum Bar Association meets. It's named in honor of a man who has led the way for other aspiring African-American attorneys. Former San Diego City Councilman and now attorney in private practice, Wes Pratt, still looks up to him. If I can maintain my composure, maintain the dignity and the integrity that Judge Gilliam possessed, and at the same time smile and laugh at some of the things that go on in the world, it, it makes it all uh, a humane existence. The man they're talking about is recuperating from heart surgery. Earl B. Gillum grew up in this Logan Heights neighborhood, attended nearby schools, and graduated from San Diego State. In 1957, he earned his law degree from Hastings College of Law, and from there went on to accomplish some major firsts in San Diego. In 1963, he became the first African-American municipal court judge. In 1975, another first, to the county superior court and a 1980 federal court. And he said just being there and being able to um, um, provide a different perspective and bring his life experiences to the administration of justice made a lot of difference. Many in the 18-year-old Bar Association recognize Gillum as a true mentor, never forgetting what it was like to start at the bottom. He always would be available for students. He would say, have students call me. They called and he picked up the phone and responded to them personally. You don't get that from very many people in that type of position of power. And that position of power is a lifetime federal appointment, and one that bar members agree the 62-year-old Judge Earl B. Gillum deserves. Maria Velasquez, News 8.
Yeah, so glad to share his story. And baseball legend Jackie Robinson wasn't from San Diego, but he sure left his mark on America's finest city. The Jackie Robinson YMCA is the only branch in San Diego County not named after a local family. He visited San Diego a few times, and CBS 8 was with him back in the 60s at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. We dug up long buried Harold Keene interviews with the baseball legend, and our Kirsten Holmes caught up with an old friend whose life was changed changed by Robinson's legacy. It's a calculated campaign against minorities. We think that the it's anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-Negro. This and, is Jackie uh, Robinson view, talking to CBS 8 back in 1964. Amen. Negroes were beginning to understand that as long as they were under the influence of a particular party, that they would still get the short end of the stick. Probably not the baseball-wielding sports icon you grew up reading about, huh? But Robinson's legacy is so wide-reaching that almost 40 years later, Kenneth Patterson II from Little Rock, Arkansas, would benefit from a scholarship foundation that changed his entire life for the better, and it was all by accident. Honestly, I didn't know anything about it. Um, Kenneth, or KP as we called him growing up, applied for some other scholarship and just happened to win the Jackie Robinson Foundation Scholarship Award. He went on to become a board member for the foundation because he says it's not often that the group helping to pay for an education also gives hands-on supplemental life tools to prepare their students for success. Whether that's learning how to be better at time management, whether that's learning how to balance a spreadsheet, whatever it is, in addition to the education that they're helping you, uh, helping you get. Like Robinson, KP is an avid golfer in a sport that's also still predominantly white. Jackie might not have been the best African-American baseball player at that time, but he was what was needed because he was the one that was gonna do his work, do his job, show up, represent, and then also kind of ignore all of the noise. Everywhere I go, I feel the need to represent his legacy because of what he and his wife, Rachel, have provided me. And it's, we talk about the gifts of time, treasures, and talents, but when you really study the life of Jackie Robinson like I have since being there for 22 years, I've learned a lot more about Jackie. Michael Brunker was the executive director for the Jackie Robinson YMCA in San Diego. Spiritually grounded, he was a family man. Not only was he the first black man to play Major League Baseball, but he also served in the military. Baseball might have been the worst of the four sports that he played. He ran track and field, he played football, basketball, and by the way, he played baseball too. Brunker says Robinson's legacy and life of service was an inspiration to those who inspire. Dr. King once said that because of Jackie Robinson, it made his work easy. And we know there wasn't anything that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did that was easy. You don't measure by how much progress has been made, in my view. I think we have to look at how much further we have to go. CBS 8 interviewed Robinson in 1968 at the height of the civil rights struggle. His words from more than 50 years ago still resonate today. Take a listen. Don't you think that there are being given opportunities for black people and other minorities in jobs and employment and in education that is unprecedented uh, from comparison with the past? Yes, but you still must take a look at the overall picture. Five, six years ago, we were making 58% of what white Americans were making. Today, we're making about 53%. While there is this kind of progress, I don't think that people recognize that the country has made fantastic progress as well, and the Negro has not made uh, proportionate progress as far as jobs, as far as activities, as far as earning a livelihood is concerned. And when it comes to athletes using their platform for social justice issues? Isn't the Negro athlete, however, in uh, the most privileged position virtually of all uh, Negroes, along with Negro entertainers? So it behooves him to get involved in the struggle so that those who are not athletes, those who are struggling, it's his responsibility to be involved. Those who have been successful, those who have been fortunate, it is a responsibility to get involved to help ensure the rights so when his child comes up may not have athletic ability or his friend's child who may not have this kind of ability can go as far as he would like to go in some other field.
Yeah, impacted so many lives and continues to do so today. And here's a line you've likely heard, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Back in 1973, Muhammad Ali, who was not only a heavyweight champion boxer, but also a civil rights leader in his own right, came to San Diego to fight Ken Norton. In 1967, he was in San Diego as part of a nationwide tour to spread the word of Elijah Muhammad. Things got a little unruly and he had to step in to protect TV8 journalists Harold Keane and Carl Gilman. Our Marcus Greaves has their story. That's my girl. Cassius Clay, or better known as Muhammad Ali, made a tremendous impact in a number of people's lives, not just in sports, but in social justice. It seemed like anywhere he went, he left an everlasting impact with not only his ability in the ring, but his charisma outside of it. That's why most fellas get hurt. <clears throat> Caught in me. Well, see, then, I, then, I, then even if I don't run, I'll just stay there and whip him. We're in the corner. Oh, wow, we both trying. Hey, yeah, we both trading. Seems gonna be taking it. I'm not gonna stand and get in the corner just because I'm in the corner to do that. I get in the corner, I get scared, and I start cooking. Coming out of that corner. That's when Frazier got messed up, following me all night, taking all that whooping. The three-time heavyweight champion made his way to San Diego back in 1973 to face off against Ken Norton. At the time, Ali held a record of 41 wins and just one loss. Muhammad, welcome back to San Diego. Glad to be here. So much noise out here, you know. How do you feel physically? Oh, I'm in good shape. You know, I'm fighting every two months, so it's going to take a heck of a man to whip me now. I'm back like I used to be. As we all know, Ali didn't lack confidence in his abilities. Oh, I'm ready. I can go. I'm not. Don't get me wrong. Now. I'm not. I'm not gonna lose. I'm not even worried about it. So I'm active. I, this will. This will be my 13th fight since Joe Frazier. You must remember my 13th fight. I'm fighting every month or two. See, I'm, and after this fight, I think we got one in Indonesia four weeks later. And then four weeks after that, we got one in Hong Kong. And five weeks after that, we might be back in Vegas. See, that's if Foreman don't do nothing. I got about, about two more million dollars lined up in fights. This event had a sold out crowd at the San Diego Sports Arena with over 11,000 in attendance. What made this fight even more significant is that this was the only time Ali fought in San Diego. Weighing in at 221 pounds, the people's choice, Muhammad Ali. The fight between Norton and Ali ended in a split decision, with Norton walking away victorious and handing Ali just his second loss. Ali's bravado aside, the match belongs to Norton. After being hypnotized by Dean, he fights perhaps the best fight of his career, seems confident and conditioned, and breaks Ali's jaw en route to a split decision. Now this fight accumulated a massive crowd and gave many the experience of a lifetime. But a naval officer wanted to protest this event because she highlighted the fact Ali refused to fight in the Vietnam War. Ali spoke out on why he made that decision. Her husband died in Vietnam fighting to free strangers, fighting for the people in the South to have a freedom to vote and do and worship as they want over the North. Well, if her husband, her husband died fighting to free these people who didn't serve America for 400 years, who didn't die in America's Japanese war, Korean war, German war, like American black man, if he was fighting to free people who never got castrated, lynched, raped for 400 years, if he's fighting to free people who didn't work 400, 316 years without a payday to make America fit his richest states on the planet, he, and they not no kinship to America, now he fought to free these people. At the same time, she backed that. But now I'm the 400-year-old black slave who caught hell, mother and father worked here, fought in all the wars, built the damn country, been raped, tore up, killed, and lynched, and burned. It's the same woman who is not standing up for me, to, for my religion, and for my belief. You understand? Aside from the fight, Ali also spoke out at Logan Heights Park about the injustice that African Americans faced in the United States. I had the chance to sit down with former Channel 8 photographer Carl Gilman, who went to cover this event and was confronted by a mob on arrival. He explained to me how Ali came to his aid. Don't y'all push the camera, man. Back up. When Muhammad Ali found out what was going on, he came to our aid immediately. And it was, uh, it all happened pretty fast, but uh, at one point I always remember where 
the crowd is really on us, and we've been hit a few times. And Muhammad Ali comes up, and he puts his arms around both of us. And he said, He's, the, these men are here to interview me. Leave them alone. And then we were able to conduct an interview and do what we came there to do, yeah. only because Muhammad Ali kept them uh, under control. Mm. He really saved us from serious injury. When, they, when we got back to the car, um, a group came, surrounded the car, and they became very angry. I guess, I'm not sure why, but they broke off the antennas on the car, and uh, they were kicking windows, and they smashed uh, the windshield. And so we had a hard time, and we were getting jostled around. Got in the car, and Muhammad Ali and Archie Moore got in front of the car and made a path to make sure we got our way out of there. So, I mean, they saved us in a number of ways, because at that point we could have been kind of trapped and uh, been in some trouble. Uh, thank you for protecting us. Here. All right, thank you're you. welcome. Everything's all right. In the end, Muhammad Ali came to San Diego and again left an everlasting impact on thousands of people's lives in the ring and outside of it and showed exactly why he was considered the people's champ. From CBS 8, yeah, let's start cooking. Yeah. I'm Marcus Greaves. Coming out of that corner. Love it. So yeah, you just saw San Diego's own boxing champion Archie Moore at the rally with Ali and at the weigh in for the 1973 fight. He was a pillar of the community and launched a youth program called Any Boy Can. In 1966, Harold Keene chatted with Moore about the program. And in 1994, he was in the hospital with heart issues when CBS 8's Chris Saunders interviewed his sons. Archie, I understand that what you have just demonstrated with your sons, you are applying at a program in Vallejo, California. Is that the A, B, and C boys, which is indicated on your cap? Yes, Harold, this is the A, B, and C uh, best foot forward class uh, that I uh, teach the youngsters up in uh, Vallejo. But the youngsters that I teach to my students are a bit older than these young ones here because these are my sons and I have begun to teach them. And I had to sacrifice a whole year of teaching my sons in order to get the program across uh, in Vallejo, where there was a lot of vandalism damage being done. And I came up to, up to Vallejo, and we soon corrected that. And now the students are on their way to become better citizens and better uh, students, people, period. And they want to be, become leaders. And uh, we teach leadership quality, honesty, fair play, respect for others, their rights, property and all of these things we teach youngsters. Archie Moore, the fighter, was a gentle man in a violent sport. Very much so. It amazes me at times that uh, him being such a soft person, but yet having that streak that uh, I guess instinctively makes you, uh, turns you champion. Come on, come on, come on. But what makes Archie Moore a true champion is his lifelong devotion to kids. He still lives in the famous house along Interstate 15, the one with a pool shaped like a boxing glove, a pool where Moore once taught kids to swim and to box. Everyone speaks of not having or the kids need more uh, images out here. Billy and our whole family has been fortunate to have from the start a perfect image, uh, yes. which makes it uh, life a lot easier. Like Archie's this. sons, Archie Jr. and Billy, say that when Archie Sr. comes home from the hospital, his youth program, ABC, Any Boy Can, is making a comeback. What we're going to do, we're going to teach kids how to step off in life with their best foot forward. The thing that my dad had worked on, has been working on for over 40 years. And uh, how to work, walk away from uh, trouble, uh, not being a coward, but through courage and dignity. Courage and dignity. Just a few of the things Archie Moore stands for. Before we can really live, uh, we've got to learn how to live in harmony together. And what Archie Moore stands for is just as much in style now as it was when he said those words Rocking more than 20 years ago. He may be having heart trouble, that, uh, 
but he's a man with a very big heart. Chris Saunders, News 8. Yeah, on more than one occasion, my parents pointed out that that swimming pool shaped like a boxing glove right off the 15. So thank you so much for watching this throwback special. To see more throwbacks like this on CBS 8 Plus, click on the News tab at the top of the screen. I'm Jenny Day. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.